I want to start out um, with a famous quote of a famous physicist. Um, in one of his lectures, uh, Richard Feynman uh, in 1959 said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. What did you mean by that? Uh, that we could build up uh, machines from atoms, basically. Uh, in 2020, we're getting closer to that, and this field is called nanotechnology. So why the black screen here at the beginning? Um, I think when looking at small things, we can compare this to looking at the night sky, for example. At first, we don't see anything, but then our eyes adjust and we start to see stars. It's the same if we look at small things. At first, we don't see anything, but then if we have a very expensive microscope and zoom in more and more, we might see something like this. And what is that? It's a colloidal semiconductor nanocrystal, something that I've been working with uh, during my PhD. And the fascinating thing here is that those little grains that you can see in this image, like all these little grains, this is actually individual rows of atoms. So um, it's not working with individual atoms, but somewhere close, right? I didn't make those. Uh, myself, those semiconductor nanocrystals. I got them from chemists who synthesized them. And when they arrive, they come in a liquid, um, um, in a little vial. And they light up in those very bright colors if you shine UV light on them. And the interesting thing about the quantum is that it's not because it's a different material, but the color is only because of the nanocrystal size. So how can we explain this? For that, we need a little bit of quantum physics. If we take a look again at the image of this uh, semiconductor nanocrystal I showed before, you can see that there's a core material and then there's a shell around. And both of these are semiconductor materials, but with a different band gap. So the core material usually has a, a smaller band gap. And in physics, we like to draw um, diagrams with, with weird scales, right? So in this case, it's uh, one axis is the diameter of the nanocrystal and the other axis is uh, energy. So what happens is because of quantum confinement, uh, if you ever follow the physics class, you have heard about this uh, so-called particle in a box. So because of this quantum confinement, uh, the energy levels uh, are restricted. And also there's uh, an additional confinement energy for electrons and holes. If we make the nanocrystal smaller, this confinement energy gets larger. All right, um, then there's another thing. Uh, because we have an electron and hole pair, there is Coulomb interaction. So we call this excited state of the quantum star an exciton. Um, and yeah, from Einstein and Planck, we have this uh, beautiful relation between energy and wavelength. So uh, smaller quantum dots uh, have a higher confinement energy and therefore they emit a shorter wavelength. Uh, in the following slides, I will use a little bit of a different picture for the quantum dots. Um, so what you can see here, basically I drew the, the energy levels as lines and uh, the valence band is completely filled with electrons uh, represented by the dark circles here. The conduction band on the other hand is completely empty. So if we do photoluminescence experiments with the quantum mass, we shine like at, um, for example, a green laser. This laser light then promotes um, an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. Subsequently, it cools down uh, to the ground state uh, of exciton, so the, also called it the band edge exciton. And this can now recombine emitting a photon uh, through spontaneous emission. If you do this now a lot of times, you will have a lot of photons coming out of the quantum dots. Uh, but if you look at a single emitter um, and the probability of a, of a time difference, delta t, between those individual photons, we kind of expect the time difference uh, 
has to be finite, right? Because it's, it's just a cycle that keeps repeating uh, where photons get emitted. All right, and this probability of a uh, time delay delta t, um, we can characterize it with this autocorrelation function g2. And for a single photon emitter, what we expect is that the probability of a time delay close to zero uh, vanishes. In the case of our point of mass, it does not quite, and there's uh, some reasons for that. If you again look at the picture of the quantum knot, but now we don't have a very weak laser, but a much stronger laser, we can excite two electrons in the collection band. They cool down. So this state we call a biexciton state. And again, this biexciton can recombine radiatively. And afterwards, uh, we have an exciton which also can recombine. So therefore, this will deteriorate the, the single photon purity of uh, the quantum emitter. On the other hand, the biexciton uh, has also a non-radiative decay mechanism. But the energy of the electron uh, is transferred to an electron and a hole, which are promoted to higher levels in the bands. And this is called Bouger recombination. And because of the small size of the quantum dots, it's very effective. And therefore, the biexciton emission quantum yield goes down a lot. And this actually makes for um, very good single photon purity because the by exciton emission is very unlikely. Uh, therefore, the, the single photon purity of the scholar emitters is quite high. Okay, I was talking about excitation before, but if we put the quantum dots in between um, appropriate materials, we can also use electrical excitation. So the, the way this happens is that first, it will always be electrons injected um, into the quantum dot. And a, a popular material is, for example, zinc oxide, which I also used in my work. Um, for the hole injection, uh, which happens after that, we usually use organic materials. And then we have an exciton and the quantum dot, which can recombine and emit single photons. So this is actually what I was working on in the beginning of my PhD. Um, what I built uh, was nanopat on quantum dot light emitting diodes. So basically, it was uh, I developed a process to make these devices where we have ideally a single quantum dot um, LED, and it's it's like encapsulated and on a very thin uh, glass. And we need this thin glass uh, to be able to look at the emission from the quantum bats with a high resolution or an immersion objective. So applying a bias, um, I was able to see uh, clearly the nanopattern structure that I put um, on these uh, samples. And what you can see there, these tiny spots in the center uh, with the pitch of five micron, those are quantum bats uh, lighting up I'm not sure whether it's a single quantum dot, but uh, it's, it's around 10 quantum dots, maybe. But you can already see that the problem with this design as well, because there's also these structures around to find my way on the sample, which always emit as well. So there's a lot of background. So yeah, that was also one reason why we didn't uh, measure single photons from these devices. Another reason was that the charge injection into the quantum dots was not really balanced. So it was much more likely to inject electrons than holes, and therefore um, a trion state is created, which is basically an exciton plus an extra electron in the conduction band. And this trion can now again recombine non radiatively as well. And therefore the quantum yield uh, gets reduced quite a lot. And one would need a, a high quantum yield state uh, as a single quantum uh, emitter to um, have enough signal uh, compared to the background to do a, a good characterization. So unfortunately, at the time, we were a bit too late working on this, and uh, single photon emission uh, from a quantum dot LED has been demonstrated by another group. They basically solved this issue by um, blocking electrons. 
So balancing the charge transport. Even though we didn't publish this uh, result, uh, I think it shows that the approach that I chose is viable for a room temperature single photon source. And the emission purity uh, is characterized by this G2 and zero time delay for colloidal quantum mass um, is actually pretty high compared to other room temperature electrically pumped emitters, of course, um, because uh, other techniques uh, can achieve much better G2. And the requirements for quantum applications are very stringent. Okay, so that was basically already the first chapter uh, of my PhD. And um, now I have two chapters to go that I want to talk about. And that's from the next slide. You might wonder, I was talking about uh, semiconductor nanocrystals in the beginning, but what about the integrated photonics, right? That was also the title of my PhD. So here is where the integrated photonics comes in. What we do a lot in our research group is use dielectric confinement in silicon nitride or silicon waveguides to guide light on small chips. Same as uh, what I have here, so it's a silicon nitride waveguide on silicon oxide, and light is guided by that. To improve the light matter interaction at the position of the quantum lattice, I uh, also have those plasmonic antennas on top of the nitride waveguide. So those focus the light where the quantum dots are. And then again, if you would zoom in there, uh, you could see that yeah, I wasn't able to work with individual quantum dots, but it's around 200 quantum dots uh, in the center of this antenna. Uh, to come back to, to my first slide, right? Uh, so one of those uh, 200 quantum dots will consist of around 10,000 atoms again. All right, so why am I doing all this? Um, the big motivation for working on integrated quantum photonics is building a, a quantum computer. And of course, we're not alone in that. There's a lot of research groups and also startups working on that. Um, the basic building blocks that one would need for integrated photonics, they're not that many, but they're very stringent requirements. So one would need single photon sources that are preferably deterministic, have a high repetition rate, um, but we also don't want to lose uh, the photons once they are emitted. So it's necessary to have high performance passive components, pure phase modulators, and also very efficient detectors with low dark counts. So I was not focusing on all of these aspects uh, in my work. Uh, rather, um, it was more uh, about uh, increasing the repetition rate of potential quantum emitters and doing that on a chip-based platform. So basically what I showed in my paper is that we can do plasmonic enhancement or spectroscopy of those uh, lead sulfide, cat sulfide quantum particles on a silicon nitride photonic chip. And the motivation for that is maybe it can be a platform for integrated quantum photonics. So what did I put on the chips, right? There's a lot of things uh, together. So there's the silicon nitride waveguides, plasmonic antennas, the quantum mass. Um, then there's uh, pump filters to get rid of the pump again, a spectrometer uh, and superconducting nanowire uh, detectors. For those detectors, I was working with a company uh, out of Delft called Single Quantum and they specialize in making those detectors for quantum optics. And basically the, the state of the art, all right? So the detection efficiency can be close to 100%, the timing chitter below 50 picoseconds for the detectors that I was using, but it can be even below 10 picoseconds. Uh, that time uh, is still quite large with 10 nanoseconds, but this is basically limited by the kinetic inductance of the devices. I don't want to talk too much about these detectors, as interesting as they are. Um, but actually, the uh, guy I was working with at Single Quantum, he's also going to defend his PhD very soon on Monday. Uh, if you're in photonics research group, uh, you might have gotten an invite for that. So if you want to learn more about superconducting nanowire detectors, I uh, invite you to really join his uh, talk um, at his PhD defense on Monday. 
So I was also um, using silicon nitride photonics, and mostly these I processed in house in our clean room. Uh, the reason I was using low fluorescence, obviously, is that if you want to work with quantum things, um, you don't want to have a signal from your waveguide as well, right? If you can't distinguish that from the quantum lab, then the whole experiment is going to be a mess. So with our in-house platform, I was able to achieve waveguide losses below a dB per centimeter, and I fabricated spectrometers uh, with an insertion loss below 1.5 dB. Uh, the design I was using there is like these uh, planar concave gratings with DBR reflectors and narrow taper tips. Another important passive component are the pump filters. Um, I designed and fabricated a filter with a 40 dB pump extinction and an insertion loss of uh, 1 dB at the wavelength of the quantum dots. Yet another thing is the stray light. It's a big issue in quantum photonics. Um, so I was putting metal next to the waveguides to absorb stray light as much as possible. All right, so now to come to the emitter enhancement using plasmonic bowtie antennas, right? So that, that's the main topic of, uh, of this chapter. So in principle, you can uh, write down the, the radiative rate of an emitter uh, in the center of such a plasmonic antenna as the initial non-radiative rate uh, plus the initial radiative rate times the non-radiative enhancement uh, plus the initial radiative rate times the radiative enhancement of the antenna. And this radiative enhancement of the antenna I'm plotting here is from simulation, right? So uh, the, the hot spot of uh, radiative enhancement is right here in the gap of the antenna. So I was using overlay lithography with our e-beam system to place colloidal quantum dots right in the center of this antenna here. And why uh, plasmonic bow tie antennas? Uh, the reason for that is that they have a very broad resonance, and uh, this broad resonance matches the emission spectrum of the quantum dots. All right, so that's just a little bit of processing, right? It's not nothing too difficult. So the first processing steps, uh, they were done by the people at Single Quantum, uh, depositing the superconducting material, doing contact patterns, etching the nanowires. And then in our clean room, I was doing the rest of the processing, which is uh, depositing the nitride, patterning the antennas, whoops, um, etching the waveguides, patterning the quantum dots on top of the antennas, putting the BCVD silicon nitride, opening contacts, and then finally wire bonding uh, the sample on, on BCB. All right, with the finished samples, uh, they would go back to Delft uh, to be measured again. So this detectors are superconducting, right? So they need cryogenic temperatures. So we would put the samples in a liquid helium bath cryostat and uh, from the top, uh, we would have a pulse laser exciting the quantum dots uh, on top of the waveguide on the antenna here, right? And then we have uh, low noise amplifiers connected to the SNSPDs and time correlated single photon counting electronics uh, recording the whole thing. So the typical thing that we would measure is a the photoluminescence decay trace like this, uh, which has quite a large background. And there's this initial laser pulse and then a quantum dot pulse. And the fact that the laser was uh, with a home built drive apartment of the CW background was quite a lot. Uh, fortunately, we found a way to deal with that. And uh, basically, what you can see here is we can separate uh, the CW uh, excitation with the pulsed excitation. And then we can plot the excitation level from the CW and the pulse part. Um, so, doing this analysis, we find that we can, in one pulse, uh, put one exciton per quantum dot, uh, roughly speaking, with the excitation level that we chose. All right, so now um, to uh, prove that we are actually speeding up uh, those quantum dot emitters, um, we have to fit uh, these PLDK curves, we'll use a stretched exponential fit. And extract the mean lifetime. And you can see, yeah, the lifetime um, quantum dots in the antenna it goes down. But that's not all of it, right? Because if you look at the formula for the radiative density of states, 
you can see that, okay, there's this part about the lifetime, but then there's also this part about the quantum yield, right? So what happens to the quantum yield? And for that, uh, we were basically looking at the count rate uh, on the detector and dividing that through the repetition rate of the laser. The number of quantum dots in this little pillar, right? You can count that from a high resolution SEM images. Then the excitation level, the coupling efficiency of the quantum dot emission to the waveguide, the waveguide loss, and the detector efficiency. And the number that came out was rather poor. That's just 1% efficiency for the quantum dots in the antenna. That's really not that great. So we would need better quantum dots if we uh, ever want to build a good platform for integrated photonics with that, integrated quantum photonics with that. But this is with the antenna. Um, without the antenna, it's even worse. And we could show that you can get around a, a 20 fold uh, enhancement of the quantum yield uh, putting the quantum dots in the antenna. And that means you can show that the radiative uh, density of states uh, we recorded a maximum value of uh, 200 uh, plus minus 50. Uh, just to put it a little bit in perspective, it's not world record or anything. Um, but it's the first time we, we do this uh, radiative enhancement on one chip. All right, so I also had a spectrometer on the chip, so we can do a uh, spectrally resolved uh, measurement um, of this uh, lifetime enhancement. For that, we, we had only four channels uh, to get that was basically the, the limitation uh, set forth by the experimental setup. So we, we had four cables uh, connecting to this uh, liquid helium bath crash set. So uh, in one cool down, we could only measure four uh, channels. So that's why we recorded four channels. And we extracted the, the lifetime and can see that uh, for the wavelength channel at around 1,100 nanometers, uh, the lifetime with and without the antenna for the quantum dots is almost the same. But then for longer wavelength, uh, this changes drastically. Uh, we can calculate uh, the rate enhancement from that. And yeah, it, it matches uh, the, the value that I was showing on the slide before. And it also matches uh, simulations of the radiative density of states. Again, we would need to look at the quantum yield here again, um, but unfortunately it was not possible to put a number on it because we did not get enough signal from the reference measurements. Uh, so yeah, we, we know that there is an enhancement because with the antenna we measure something, but we cannot uh, quantify it because we don't have a reference. So in conclusion, um, I created a platform for lifetime spectroscopy of solution process emitters. So just using a single chip, uh, we, can, we can do a spectroscopy characterization of the emitters. Um, we, we showed a large percel enhancement using the plasmonic antennas for the quantum dots. And um, if we had quantum dots with a higher uh, quantum efficiency, this platform should scale down to single emitters. Uh, because the quantum efficiency was so poor, uh, we had to use uh, around 200. And recently, so there have been a lot of improvements with uh, nanocrystal emitters uh, for quantum optics. And there's been some uh, science papers uh, just last year about this. But still, um, there are other requirements for many quantum optics experiments, like uh, indistinguishability, uh, which the color limiters are not really close yet. All right, so that was the first two chapters. Uh, one chapter to go. And the, the title of this last chapter is uh, Waveguide Couple Colloidal Quantum Dot Emitting, uh, Colloidal Quantum Dot Light Emitting Diastasy, and I can't even pronounce it. But what it was really about this project is making an electrically pumped laser with colloidal quantum dots. So uh, basically, uh, away from quantum applications uh, back uh, to conventional optoelectronic devices. Um, but the, the goal here would be to make a laser that's completely solution processable and would therefore be very cheap to make. 
All right, so uh, what about gain in, in these uh, color formulas? I've only been talking about single photon emission before, right? So, um, if we want lasing, we need gain. Um, and the quantum lots uh, that I was working with, uh, based on Cat's Salamat Cat's whole fight, they have a twofold generated ground state. So, what this means is if you have an exciton in your quantum dot, uh, a photon comes in, it can either be absorbed, forming a bi exciton, uh, or uh, there can be stimulated emission, right? But these processes uh, have the same likelihood, and therefore you will never get a net gain out of your sample if you just have excitons in there. So it's necessary um, to excite the quantum dots uh, much more, uh, create by excitons, and then the absorption event is not allowed anymore. So then you uh, can really have stimulated emission and lasing from the quantum dots. The problem is, though, as I've shown before, that the by exciton emission doesn't have a very good quantum yield, and uh, that the Oshie recombination um, can kill a lot of this gain for lasing. So there's a trick, another science paper from last year. Um, it's possible to lower the gain threshold if you negatively charge the quantum dots. Uh, how can you understand this? So now I put an extra charge in the quantum dot. And of course, uh, if a photon comes in, uh, it can still be absorbed, right? Uh, but after this trion is formed, um, for the next photon, there, there can only be uh, stimulated emission. This means uh, that the lasing threshold should be reduced. If you don't put uh, two extra electrons in the conduction band uh, already uh, without putting any excitation on the quantum dot, uh, the absorption is not possible anymore of, of, of this certain energy. So basically what happens here uh, is uh, we created a three level system uh, for lasing uh, with those quantum dots. So uh, if you excited you, uh, if you excite this doubly charged quantum dot, you promote another electron in the conduction band, um, then you should uh, get your, uh, in theory, uh, get zero threshold gain. All right, so that's the idea uh, of, of gain uh, from quantum dots. Uh, people have been working on that for quite a while, um, also uh, people in our group. So that is uh, work from the PhD student um, of Fritz, who was working on this before me. And it's about optically pump lasing, right? Uh, everything we've been doing uh, here uh, with color quantum dots has been optically pumped so far. But there's also, uh, if you look at literature, there's also um, proof of uh, gain from electrically pump uh, from electrical pumping for those quantum dots. So it's kind of the question, okay, uh, you can make an optically pumped laser, plus you can get gain from electrically, uh, electrical injection. So why has nobody uh, been able to make an electrically pumped laser? And the reason for this is that uh, these LED devices with uh, color quantum dots, they have a current density limitation. So um, it's only possible to invert a very thin quantum dot layer. And with this uh, thin quantum dot layer, it is not possible to confine an optical mode. So what we've come, uh, come up with now for that issue is a photonic solution. So basically, we're using a silicon nitride waveguide to confine the optical mode and then minimize the losses from the N contact layer and the P contact. So that way we can decouple uh, the optical mode from the quantum dot layer thickness. Yeah, and that's, that's how the um, band structure of this device looks like, and that's like a, uh, a sketch in, in 3D uh, out of Blender, right? So uh, we're using a very similar structure uh, as for the single photon emitters, like in the very beginning that I was showing you. We inject the electrons from zinc oxide into the quantum dots and the holes from the organic layers. Question is, is this a viable approach, right? Um, so it, it uh, really relies on the fact that we can find and fabricate a very low loss and contact layer. 
And this is critical because the optical mode is always going to be uh, confined in this end contact layer, and it's inherent to our approach. So it needs to have good band alignments, uh, adjustable conductivity, the optical loss uh, should be limited to free carry absorption, and the processing should work as well, right? So we did quite a few experiments, and um, then we found that if we do some rapid thermal annealing, we can reduce the wave gap losses magically, and also the uh, sheet resistance of the zinc oxide layer uh, that was deposited by ALD by collaborators uh, from the University of Kent. Um, yeah, sheet resistance uh, gets reduced and the wave gap loss go down. Um, not quite sure yet why uh, this happens, but it's good news. And we can also process these layers. Uh, so what you see here is a part of the silicon nitride covered with this end contact layer and the other part uh, where it's been etched away. And that works without any residue. So basically, you can fabricate uh, silicon nitride structures, coat everything with zinc oxide, and then remove it again where we don't want it. All right. Um, so that is the end contact, uh, but there's also the, the P contact metal, um, which can give a lot of passive loss. So therefore, we need to put the rather thick organic layers uh, to suppress the loss uh, from the, uh, the peak contact map. And this is a, it's a trade off, right? Um, in the end, the wavecat dimensions that we choose, uh, they will always have a, a trade off between the coupling efficiency, the waveguide loss, and also the existence of higher order modes, uh, which we don't really like too much uh, in photonics. All right. So the, the initial results for the zinc oxide um, looked good. Uh, so the recent Sega said to me, well, uh, just develop a process to fabricate that, right? How hard can it be? Uh, so again, back to the clean room for me. And um, we were using quite a few collaborations for that because we couldn't deposit all the layers uh, on our own. So first I was fabricating the silicon nitride uh, waveguide structures and I went to STETA to get ALD layers, brought them back to our clean room, um, put the contact metals, uh, patterned the, the zinc oxide and then put the PCVD silicon oxide. Now we need to etch down the PCVD oxide again on top of the waveguides. Uh, therefore I developed some planarization process using RE, uh, high uh, alignment accuracy lithography with, uh, with the E-beam as well, and uh, removing uh, the aluminum oxide, which serves as protection in, in a wet removal afterwards. For the quantum dots, uh, sorry. Um, for the quantum dots, uh, I was again collaborating with uh, Professor Sega Hansen's group, and we got material from them that we spin coated in the lift of process on top of the waveguides. And then for the organics, it was a third collaboration with the LCP group, uh, who did this organics evaporation for me on top of the devices. Um, so what you can see here at the bottom is like a comparison of the FIPSEM cross section with the actual device, right? So it's not perfect. Uh, there's a little notch here, um, but yeah. Uh, whatever is as perfect as we draw it in our sketches. So the, these devices that are fabricated, they work as wavecat couple LEDs. Uh, the basic parameters uh, look comparable to planar devices, um, but uh, because we, we need a very thick organic layer to reduce the loss from the P-mantle, uh, there's a large series resistance and we need quite high bias voltages, as you can see here. Um, yeah, so the, the electrical turn on is uh, around two volts. And uh, yeah, after that, we, we need to uh, apply quite more voltage bias to really get to high current densities. And with our devices, uh, actually, we've achieved the highest current densities published to date um, for polar quantum LEDs. Just because they are so small, there's uh, current focusing going on, and also thermally they behave a lot better than larger planar devices. The optical turn-on is also uh, at the low voltage, 
as it, as it should be. Um, another thing we see is um, that there is a redshift of the electroluminescence compared to photoluminescence of the sample in solution. And that is, amongst other things, uh, due to self-absorption along the waveguide. There are also some simulations uh, of the um, uh, electrical behavior of these devices. Uh, and there we can clearly see that it is the organic layers that cause uh, this large series resistance. So it's not, it's not the zinc oxide that's very thin um, and on top of the silicon nitride waveguides, but rather the um, thick organic layers uh, that make it necessary to apply quite a large uh, electric potential. And then here you can see a lot of the current density. So there's some uh, current focusing um, going on that allows for higher current densities in our devices compared to a plain, a planar a quantum LEDs. All right, so it's a waveguide coupled uh, LED. We can also operate it as a photo detector if we apply a reverse bias. And it has a quite large uh, low dark current of around 1.5 uh, times uh, 10 to the minus 6 amps per square centimeter. But there are still some issues with the detector. So the absorption spectrum uh, looks OK. It matches the one of the quantum dots in solution. But uh, the charge extraction uh, is not ideal. and uh, would need some more development. And the issue there is that when using quantum dots, uh, which are covered with uh, organic ligands, and those are necessary to have a high photoluminescence quantum yield. Uh, but for the detectors, uh, they hinder the charge extraction. And therefore, we also uh, don't have a linear dependence of the photocurrent on the optical input power. So this is basically related to, to the last uh, graph uh, because uh, this current is not saturating really here. Right, so the LED performance, uh, they work as LEDs, but the output power is uh, rather low. And uh, yeah, the output part also saturates very quickly with the current density. Uh, one reason for this uh, saturation is a, a reduction of the quantum yield because of the charge imbalance, right? So for a LED, you wouldn't want to have the try on emission. But as I explained in the beginning of this, uh, of this uh, part, uh, for a laser um, try on emission, might actually be beneficial uh, for reducing the gain threshold. Uh, so it's not clear. It depends on what you want to make. If you want to have uh, an LED only, uh, then you need, would need to work uh, a lot on achieving better um, charge balance in the devices. Another thing we observed is that uh, at high uh, bias voltages, we see, we see a redshift. And we assign this to uh, heating and also the quantum confined start effect. So that is all about LEDs and the detectors. Uh, it's basically uh, what, what I achieved. But uh, the goal was making a laser, right? And achieving uh, stimulated emission would be a milestone for making the devices uh, useful and also getting uh, some output power out of these devices that's uh, much higher than, than the nanowatt output power uh, that I measured. Um, so to characterize the intrinsic gain of the material, uh, we use a spectroscopy um, technique called transient absorption spectroscopy. So there it's again a femtosecond optical pump. And for the quantum that we're using, um, we extracted a, a gain lifetime of 100 picosecond. Um, and the gain should first appear around the wavelength of 650 nanometers. So we tried um, to measure transparency at 650 nanometers because the gain should first appear there, right? Uh, but instead, what we saw is uh, excess loss uh, appearing with uh, increasing bias voltage. And there's several reasons for that. First of all, um, the quantum confined start effect and heating, they shift not only the electroluminescence emission, but also the absorption spectrum. 
So therefore, if the absorption spectrum is shifted, uh, we um, measure at 650, yeah, we would expect uh, some kind of uh, excess loss contribution from that. But also, uh, we suspect there's some charging going on, um, that uh, charges get trapped in the quantum dot or the zinc oxide layer and cause additional losses at high bias voltages. So then the, the question is, okay, we, we can't measure any transparency, but in theory, would there be enough gain from these quantum lands? Um, to answer this question, uh, I went back to optically uh, on lasers. So I fabricated waveguides uh, with the sidewall corrugation acting as a DFB rating, and they have a, the end contact layer and quantum dots on top. And we see some peaks appearing that look like uh, they could be uh, from a DFB laser. But unfortunately, this sample died uh, very soon after this measurement uh, because it was applying a too, too high uh, pump of power. So, in theory, it should be enough gain um, from the quantum dots to offset off all the losses, but uh, something for the PhD student following up on my work, uh, it would still also help to reduce the passive losses even more. This can be done by changing um, the design already. Uh, so, there's, there's a trade-off uh, of course, here, if you want to make a DFB laser with the sidewall corrugation, you, you can't make the waveguide too wide because then the grading strength for your fundamental mode will go down significantly and you will get a multi mode lazy. Um, but if you choose uh, to put another kind of uh, reflector on both sides of the waveguide, uh, you can go to wider waveguides, which should have a higher modal gain. All right, um, yeah, I, I'm a bit uh, sad that I, I have to stop working uh, on this now, um, since it seems to me we're getting very close, uh, uh, but I'm going to be uh, following up uh, with uh, what the PhD students uh, continue in this project uh, will come up with uh, to solve this issue and uh, finally make an electrically pumped laser with uh, quality quantum dots. All right, um, with that, I want to I wanna conclude. I tried to cram in as much information as possible uh, in these uh, roughly 45 minutes, I, I hope. Um, I was talking about three main projects uh, I was doing during my PhD. The first was building an electrically pumped uh, room temperature single photon source with colloidal quantum knots. The second project, uh, was about a platform for integrated quantum photonics. And basically what we show is uh, not the full platform, um, but plasmonic enhancement of quantum dot emitters and spectroscopic characterization on one single silicon nitride chip. The last work uh, that I was doing was aimed at making the lasers that are electrically pumped with colloidal quantum bats. And what I showed you there was uh, the results uh, that hopefully uh, soon uh, being published about a waveguide coupled LED and detectors on the silicon nitride platform. All right, with that, I want to come back uh, to my black slide. And uh, also the analogy of, of the night sky that I was talking about in the beginning. So, well, if you look at the night sky, right, first you don't see anything, um, but then when your eyes can adjust, you, you can finally see the stars. It's very similar if you go into a photonics lab. Uh, if it's a visible lab, then it's going to be dark, right? Um, so at first, you'll probably not see anything. It's uh, not really surprising. It might take a little bit longer than just a few moments uh, before you can see something, right? But also, we have to keep looking in order to find something. But then again, there might be nothing. Never know before. All right, that I'm done. Um, okay. okay, thank you very much, dear candidates, for the very clear and very interesting presentation. Thank you.